Welcome to Hidden Geometry in the title page of the first folio, part one. I'll begin by introducing our tools. In order to figure out exactly what geometry we see on the title page, we don't have to use much. All we need is a protractor, the 23 letter Latin alphabet gematria values, a straight edge, the Latin alphabet repeated count, and our brains. When I first began investigating all of the puzzles and clues and hidden in the first folio, I noticed something on the title page that I thought nobody else had noticed before. The W actually consists of two letter Bs jammed closely together. Now, I didn't realize at the time that this was a common practice in Elizabethan and Jacobian writing because the letter W was really not that common. It only came about partway through the 17th century. Prior to that, two Vs would substitute as the letter W. Therefore, I concluded was a double V. But then I did something that I don't believe anybody else had done before. I asked myself, what would happen if I drew a line from the middle of those two V's straight down to the bottom of the page? This is what resulted. As you can see, the line went straight through the comma after jaggered. That told me that somebody was measuring out words and letters and aligning them to objects, or aligning them to each other, pardon me. There was even more to this. And through specific letters in the title. Like so. But I'm going to get into that in another video. Suffice it to say that I did what I could to ensure that I got every correct. If anybody can find other clues and interesting puzzles, let me know in the comments. We'd already gone through sacred geometry in the title page. Now I'm going to get into some personal geometry. I was looking at the doublet and I thought that perhaps there was something about the angle at which this panel was drawn. More specifically, what was the difference in angle between these two parts, borders actually, of the doublet panel? I 
took the protractor and I took the right hand line as a baseline. I measured them out. And I discovered that they are exactly 20 degrees apart from each other. That told me that these lines, where they terminate, is a lot more than it looks at the surface. And of course, when you shade in the doublet and make it into a spear point, you come up with this line. Right up at the top. Right to where the small uppercase R is in Mr., which has a gematria value of 17. V next to it in William has a gematria value of 40. And I'll let that kind of sit there for a moment. Ends also at an interesting place. Right at the lowercase g in Jaggard, the second one. And it told me that this is another possible allusion to God's hand in the plays. Next, I decided to ask what was going on with the arm lines. Considering that this portrait, this image, looks so flat. It lends itself so well to measuring out lines and angles in the figure. So I did exactly that with the arms, the bands that are of embroidery that are in the center of the sleeves. Arm line angles for the left is 54 degrees. On the right, it's 45, well, actually minus 45. This is a mirror image, suggesting to me that the image, the figure that we see, is a mirror of somebody else. Here we start with left inner arm line one, which is the furthest to the left. As you can see, the line terminates precisely where the left-hand bar of the collar ruff meets the chin. It also points to the T and the I in Martin. I next looked at left inner arm line two. This one, of course, terminates just to the right of the collar ruffs bar. But peculiarly enough, the line also points to the strange letter N, which almost looks like an M in Martin. Next, I looked at inner arm line three. This one is even more interesting than the previous line. It terminates exactly where the right hand bar of the collar ruff meets the chin. And in the signature, it points to the gap between the O and the E in Drossout. Last of the left inner arm lines, number four, told me something very interesting. First of all, it terminates up at the top, right where the 
right hand bar of the collar ruff meets the chin, but in the signature, it is exactly pointing to the E and the S in Droshaupt, which tells me that the E and the S are significant, simply because, as you can see here, he spaced the O and the E further apart than the E and the S, and he also spaced the S and the H further apart, possibly as a signal that something is going on in the portrait and in the page that goes beyond just telling you the title and a name. For reasons which will be made clear, I considered lines one and four as being the most important. I next looked at right inner arm line one. As you can see in the left hand detail, it terminates precisely where the dart on the collar ruff meets the chin. And in the right hand detail, it goes straight between two little embroidered beads on the shoulder panel. I then looked at right inner arm line too. Some more interesting details. When the right hand detail shows that the line goes straight through two embroidered chains on the link, or links, pardon me, on the chain on the shoulder. Nicely through one of the embroidered beads. And it also terminates exactly where the collar dart meets the chin. Right in her arm line three gives us some more interesting features. You can see the line goes straight between two links in the embroidered chain. In the collar, the wire support and the right hand bar of the collar ruff actually are spaced evenly apart from where the, this line terminates. In fact, I bet you if you took a measuring tool, you'd probably see that it is close to right in the middle as possible. This tells me, and it should tell viewers, that the portrait, the engraving, is not that of a real person, but it is designed to encode all sorts of clues in the Shakespeare authorship game. Next, I looked at right inner arm line four. This one is also a significant line for several reasons. As you can see in the right hand detail, the line splits one of the links in the embroidered chain. goes through one of the embroidered beads precisely. And when you look at it, there is no way that this could have been done just by somebody sitting at for a portrait. Again, for reasons that will be made clear, I consider lines one and lines four as being important. 
Next, I asked myself what the pairs of lines would look like if I drew them together. So here's the line one pair. As you can see, they terminate where you would expect them, right where the line ones for the left arm and the right arm end. extend the lines into the face, we see something interesting. You can see that the occipital lobe, or the orbit, the eye socket, the line crosses precisely where the furthest point in the eye socket is located. Of course, it terminates straight there at the base of the fourth dart in the collar ruff. In, in the left hand bar of the collar ruff. Giving us three anchor points, suggesting that this is something that we are supposed to see. Next, we look at the line two pair. The pair exactly ends where the line twos meet. See that line one goes through not just one, but two embroidered beads. When we lines outwards, the hand line actually is parallel to the eye socket. And line actually crosses the deepest, the most shallow point in the hairline. And the right hand line also crosses straight where the corner of the mouth is on the right hand side. Once again, we have three different points suggesting that this could be a puzzle clue. Next, we look at line three. Line three is also inevitable and predictable. We can see that the collar lines are actually terminating where they were at the beginning. And we also have an embroidered bead that's crossed by the left hand line at the top of the collar. Where a bead is located in the bend in the collar itself. When we extend the lines outwards into the face, we see that the right hand line parallels exactly one side of the figure's mouth. Hand line goes straight through the earlobe at the same angle as the earlobe. Well, within a fraction of a degree at least. Then I looked at line four and as you can see this is one of the reasons why I figure that these are important lines. 
the end at the same spot. Just to the right of the right hand bar on the collar ruff. But if you notice, the embroidered beads are also crossed by these lines and they are pretty much exactly horizontal from each other. This gives me more evidence that this portrait plus the doublet were designed according to a plan. Now, when you cross the lines across the face, when you extend those lines across the face, you see something also quite interesting. The right hand line is parallel to the left hand hairline, the part that's a bit crooked. Also follows the left hand side of the upper lip where it curves down beneath the nose. Line is parallel to the earlobe and splits it practically in half. Again, we have three perfectly logical, perfectly visible points of contact, which I call anchor points, suggesting that we are supposed to see these lines. When we expand the detail and enlarge the detail rather, you can see them far easier. more evidence that this is not a portrait of a real person. Once again, I figure that line pair number one and number four are important, and this is the reason why. They create hidden letters. First of all, we'll look at where line, the line one pairs end up. Next, we look at the line four terminal points. Now we'll combine the two and extend them upwards up into the top of the page. They create a big X, almost like we're Xing out the person who's on the title page. What I did next was quite interesting. I decided to take the left hand arm line because that's the only arm line that's on the top of his tricep. And I drew a line from that straight to the top of the page, but then I mirrored that. I did exactly the same angle, but it's opposite. What happened? The X became bigger. Like that. In this X, you can see that there are two different pairs of letters. First of all, Up two letter V's. We can see that they both end between the wire support on the right hand side of the collar dart and the right hand bar on the collar ruff. Next, we take the colors out, and now we see what the bottom lines do. 
This is the side lines one and four pairs. We look at the outer arm lines. We get two letter V's, but in an enlargement, we can see that the points where they meet is exactly where we have a very, very tiny detail in the iris. You can see by this enlargement, this extreme enlargement, that Drosshout used extremely fine burns and cutting tools in order to make so many details in this portrait so that he gets everything exact from the shading in the eyelid to the eyebrow, the shading in the tear duct, the line above the, <clears throat> and, and also the lines, pardon me, outlining the eyelid. Concentrate on that little spot there. What's going to happen next is going to blow your mind just as it blew my mind. Of course, these are all sorts of details that have been purposely put into this engraving. Now, in the pupil has actually been modified from the original state one engraving and actually the state two engraving for the following reason. I'm going to explain these estates in another video, but people can go to the Folger Library website and look up states of the engraving. But here's what happens. If you take that little glint and fill it in, you can line it up with the detail in the iris to give you a perfect tiny mason square. That tells me that masons were extremely clever and extremely careful about what they showed on this engraving. In a future video, I'm going to tell you another reason why this is important. But considering that we've got anchor points in these lines, an anchor point for the outer arm line right beside the nose, the nostril rather. Perfectly along the bottom of the earlobe. Pretty much the diameter of the bottom dart on the collar ruff. Presenting a monogram. Previously, we saw that the panel, the left-hand panel, the difference in degrees between the two sides of the panel is 20 degrees. But that is also in Gematria. The letter O is partially enclosed in that letter. I believe this is supposed to be a monogram. Next, we're going to give some more interesting features of this engraving. You've heard of Triple H, the wrestler. 
this is triple V. Of course, when we looked at the engraving at the beginning of this video, saw that the two sides of the panel doublet on the left hand side rather create a letter V. But we all in the lip. creates a perfect letter B. Now we always need three of something in order to ascertain whether or not we're on the right track. Well, here's that third V. Right on the collar, just below the second button. More to this. We create another letter V from the line just below the top button. Once again, we have Tria Sunt Omnia in which something is repeated three times. In this case, letter O and the letter V. And we have two ways to get the third V. Presenting one little puzzle. And he got it from another person whose name I unfortunately have misplaced. But two darts on the left hand side of the collar, and we can in interpret the letter or the number 11. Or darts on the right hand side of the collar rough. Yeah, when you add these up, don't miss hidden geometry in the title page of the first folio, part two. Thank you for watching. Stay safe.